Hello everybody, thank you for joining us today. You are part of the 400 people worldwide who have registered to this webcast powered by Yol Development, System Plus Consulting, and World Speed. This webcast is entitled Porosic Life in the Fast Line as Sick Penetration Accelerates. My name is Faisal El Kamasi. I'm a global sales support and coordinator manager for Yol Development. Before we get start the webcast, let me just give you some basic information on this webcast. You have the possibility to submit questions during all the webcasts. You can use the Ask a Question window at the bottom of the screen. We will answer as many questions today as we can, and for the remaining one, we will follow up via email. Concerning the materials, please note that the presentation are already available and they can be downloaded from the resources section of the platform. Furthermore, you will receive tomorrow an email with the link to the recorded webcast session. So let's start the webcast. I'm pleased to welcome the three speakers of this webcast. Dr. Esgi Dogmus, Team Lead Analyst, Compound Semiconductors and Emerging Substrates at YOL Development. Amin Alouche, Technology and Cost Analyst at System Plus Consulting. Dieter Elizabeth, Director Strategic Business Development Automotive at Wolfspeed. How three speakers will share with us their knowledge and expertise. I'm pleased to welcome our first speaker, Esgi Dogmus. Esgi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Faisal. Hello, everyone. And thanks for your interest in this webcast. So it's a pleasure for me to co-animate this session with System Plus Consulting and one of the market leaders, WorldSpeed. So I would like to share our analysis today on power seek market and the emerging supply chain. So very shortly, let me introduce you to uh, your group of companies. So your development is a market research and consulting company. It provides a strategy consulting um, uh, through a broad report collection and also finance, finance services. Together with System Plus Consulting, specialized in reverse engineering, we do cover a wide range of microelectronic industries, from sensing, photonics, memory, uh, to power, RF electronics, and also the compound semiconductors. So speaking of the compound semi, here you see a list of materials that we cover in our activity. So we tackle the, the main established semiconductors, such as silicon carbide, gallium nitride, gallium arsenide, and indium phosphide. But we also do track the latest developments and ecosystems of the emerging semiconductor substrates, such as the bulk gum, gallium oxide, diamonds, engineer substrates, and others. So today's topic is, is, is very hot, as you know, so we will speak of the power of silicon carbide. So let's start. So we can say today that we are all witnessing a transition in our daily lives so with the arrival of the mega trends. So definitely speaking, it's the um, electric mobility. So initially, the global target of uh, electrific electrification was, as you see, as on the right curve. So, um, however, over the last years, we, there has been some factors accelerating this development of vehicle electrification, and we are listing them here. So, we can say Tesla effect was one of them. Another one was the battery cost reduction. And even last year, like following the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak, this curve got steeper. So, the governments all around the world, China or in uh, Europe, they strengthened their carbon dioxide reduction targets and they put in place new incentives to encourage the electric vehicle buyers. So as a response, the car makers have heavily invested in this transition, so more than $250 billion of investment have, has been done over the last years. And at YOL, in this context, we, for, we forecast over 40 million electric and hybrid electric vehicles by 2026, uh, with posting more than 35% compound annual growth rate. So what does this significant growth bring for the white band gaps, especially for the silicon carbide? Here we have listed possible market entry points for silicon carbide. 
It can be in the traction inverter, in the onboard charger that I will call OBC, and the DC-DC converters. And you see that the power requirements that we have on the y-axis and the total addressable market that you see with the dollar icons here are completely different for these three applications. So first of all, the main or the traction inverter requires high power systems. So it will also necessitate large number of high power density devices. The OBC and the DC-DC converters, on the other hand, they operate at lo relatively lower power level. So they need lower number of power devices. So we can note that the market size is much higher for the main inverters than those of the OBC and DC-DC converters. So as of today, compared to silicon-based systems, both SIC and GAN are bringing attractive advantages. So this could be high efficiency, high power density, and high thermal conductivity, especially in the case of silicon carbide. So the wide band gaps are also offering a space saving with a smaller passives and also eventually lower system costs. So today, the car makers and the tier ones can go for different technology platforms at the device level. Of course, it will depend on their strategy. But in general, as of today, uh, we are seeing that SIC is more of interest for high power, for example, for traction inverters or the OBC while GAN is more of interest or being developed for lower power OBC or DC-DC converters. And in the next slide, we will have a look at the biggest market opportunity for silicon carbide, which is in the traction inverters. So in the transition to this electrification, there are many design parameters so which make us choose one car, one electric vehicle, over another. So there are, of course, many selling points for each uh, EV brand today, but amongst them, one important one is the higher driving range, or in other words, larger autonomy. So at this point, the, the OEMs are trying to adapt several approaches to do so. Here we have identified seven different approaches on this slide. So this could be a larger battery capacity, higher voltage battery, higher efficiency inverters, um, or AC motors. But also it can be, as you see in number five, the reduced loads or a more aerodynamic design or go also for autonomous driving. But if I come back to silicon carbide now, amongst these approaches, we see two uh, big opportunities for silicon carbide. So the first one, as you see, it's in the third case on the, on the right in green. So three years ago, I think many of you know now, Tesla made a move and demonstrated in its models that silicon carbide can enable high power density and also reduce system size. This is also the case of Chinese BYD in its models launched last year. In addition, Japanese Toyota has also chosen to use um, silicon carbide boost converters in its full cell electric vehicles. So it has just been launched in the last quarter. And the second market opportunity for silicon carbide can be as we see here on the second case, so in the yellow box. So here the idea is to increase the battery voltage up to 800 volts. So which will also boost the driving range and also enable the fast charging. So some of the OE automotive OEMs who have chosen silicon carbide devices are listed here. So Hyundai, General Motors, Daimler, Audi, and many big names. So what we see is almost all automotive OEMs are working on silicon carbide. So now let's see how the market will be like in next years. So in our activity at YOL, we follow the compound semiconductors, SIC and GAN, on a quarterly basis. So we took, took this decision because we see that the markets are very dynamic. So in this quarterly updated chart from the Q4 2020 edition, we see right away that the automotive segment um, in orange here is dominating the global SIC device market. So even though the markets slowed down due to pandemic outbreak early 2020, the EVHEV market growth continues and the SIC adoption continues as well. So for example, in 2020, Tesla made a great year by ramping up quickly in their Chinese facility. Similarly, BYD took the move to adopt this silicon carbide in the main inverters, and we see this trend going on to the next years. So speaking of the future, what are the different strategies for actors to grab bigger, mar bigger market share? So coming back to this, um, uh, EV market, I think you have just seen that it's an emerging one, and the traction inverter represents one of the largest market opportunity for silicon carbide. So as we all know from power electronics uh, world, uh, at higher power level, power modules are required. 
So therefore, the expertise in silicon carbide module packaging is highly needed. So indeed, over the last two years, we have seen various part partnerships uh, between the leading device manufacturers, such as Creebox Speed, and also ROM, with the tier ones or module packagers. So for example, while Cree partnered with ABB, Delphi, ZF, and Starpower, ROM also teamed up with Continental and Lead Drive. And as for example, for a player who desires to climb up this ladder is 2.6 on the right of this chart. So the substrate provider acquired Ascatron and they started licensing uh, General Electric's module technology. On the other hand, we also do see, of course, the established discrete and power module manufacturers such as Infineon, OnSemi, or ST Microelectronics, developing and using actively the silicon carbide module technology to meet the OEM's uh, demands. And finally, not last but not least, the Tier 1, Bosch, or OEM BYD, are also developing or using internal silicon carbide model expertise in order to address this segment. So finally, this slide summarizes well our understanding of silicon carbide device market evolution. So historically, this market was driven by photovoltaics and power supply applications, and SIC is today penetrating more and more in the EV market but also in high power charging infrastructure um, applications in the next five to 10 years. In addition, yeah, we do of course follow, follow closely leading players. So the market leader in 2019, HT Microelectronics has benefited from its uh, collaboration with Tesla on the SIC based main inverters and significantly increased the revenues over the last two years. And in the ranking, we do also see number two, yeah, the Cree and three, um, number three, sorry, ROM, who have invested significantly in the six substrates and also the device production capacity in order to meet the demand in this emerging market. So we will see uh, in, in both speed and detail presentation more details on, on that part, which is very exciting. And similarly, Infineon and OnSemi are also in the race, of course, in order to target this automotive and industrial applications. And what we can say that over the last quarters, uh, all of these actors actually have announced exciting design wins at automotive OEMs, also strategic partnerships that we follow very closely within our team in order to understand the future development. So I think it's uh, nice to say, it's important to say that in a nutshell, um, the EV market is disruptive, so it's creating new business models and it's opening new opportunities for almost all actors through the value chain. So these slides come from our Compound Semi Monitor uh, service, in which we track the key, key markets in Power RF and also optoelectronics on a quarterly basis. So within the Power Electronic module, as you see here, we are covering SIC and GAN, and the wafer and EPI wafer markets, as well as the revenues, strategies, and roadmap of the leading actors that you see here on the left uh, of this um, page. In addition, many of our slides also come from our broad report collection on power and compound semi-activity. So we update these reports annually in our uh, division. And finally, yeah, this, with this slide, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope to see you soon in some power or compound semi events. And I'm looking forward to your questions at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Esli. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, let's now welcome our next speaker uh, from System Plus Consulting, uh, Amin Alouche. Amin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, so welcome again to this webcast. Uh, my name is Amin Alouche. I'm a technology and cost analyst at System Plus Consulting, and I'll be uh, giving a technology and cost overview uh, about silicon carbide power MOSFETs. So first, uh, I will present the technology roadmap of silicon carbide technology. Then I'll point out some challenges faced by technical uh, and commercial challenges faced by silicon carbide devices. Uh, next, I will illustrate this by some of uh, examples of devices we have analyzed uh, in our laboratory. And finally, I will give some cost aspects uh, of uh, silicon carbide devices. So first, um, this graph shows uh, the identified silicon carbide uh, discrete transistors in the market. Uh, these devices uh, are packaged in discrete uh, uh, packaging. So as you may see here, uh, the majority of uh, players are offering uh, 
devices at 1.2 K volt, but also at 650 volt and at 1.7 K volt as well. So here uh, we show a technology roadmap where we summarize uh, the main technologies uh, introduced in the last years uh, from the different players. Uh, mainly uh, the historical players, uh, we can say, they remain the leaders uh, in proposing and offering new technologies. Uh, these players have uh, already proven their mastering of silicon carbide technology, and the majority of them have their uh, own way for supplier. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's now talk uh, about uh, some uh, challenges faced by silicon carbide devices. So as you may know, silicon carbide is uh, considered as a very good candidate for high-density systems and for high-temperature operation as well. So however, it still has a um, limited impact uh, in new products. Uh, compared to silicon carbide devices. This is mainly due to a higher cost of silicon carbide devices. Uh, in fact, this can be explained with different aspects. Uh, so first, uh, you know, the silicon carbide wafer uh, aspect is uh, challenging uh, in the sense that uh, wafer is a major challenge to have a very reliable device uh, at the end. Uh, as well, uh, really high quality wafers are needed uh, and limited suppliers still offer this uh, high quality uh, wafer and they offer them at high price compared to silicon wafers as well. Another aspect concerns the manufacturing process of silicon carbide devices. Um, this is linked to some process steps of a manufacturing such as uh, implantation that needs high temperature, for example, uh, gate oxide growth as well, especially for a trench gate structure. Last but not least, silicon carbide packaging. Uh, this is a challenging point again for silicon carbide and new packaging technologies are uh, being investigated and developed uh, in order uh, to optimize uh, the actual offer. Um, and we see on the right some examples of uh, power modules, uh, including silicon carbide chips. So what about the designs of uh, silicon carbide MOSFETs? So at System Plus Consulting, we have analyzed uh, the main uh, devices and the main technologies existing in the market from different players, and we could uh, classify them into two main categories according to the gate uh, structure. So the first category is the planar gate structure, uh, which is offered by uh, many players, uh, such as wall speed, drum semiconductor, ST microelectronics, and others. Uh, this structure is known to, uh, to have a less complex manufacturing process uh, compared to the other category uh, of devices, which is the trench gate. Uh, device uh, mainly offered by Infineon and Ram Semiconductor. Uh, this structure um, has interesting uh, electrical performances. Uh, let's have a look now about the manufacturing process flow for both designs. So in this slide we are, have summarized um, the main process steps of manufacturing silicon carbide MOSFET with uh, uh, example of planar device from wall speed and uh, uh, double trans structure uh, from RAM semiconductor. So as you may notice here, uh, the main process steps are basically the same concerning the wafer thinning, epitaxial growth, implantations, and uh, different layers patterning. Uh, the only difference uh, may concern the uh, silicon carbide etching in order to perform the trenches, which may have an additional cost impact uh, for the uh, trench devices cost compared to the planner uh, design cost. Let's now have a more concrete uh, examples of devices we have analyzed. And I start by uh, wall speed, 
So um, we have analyzed all the technology uh, generations from wall speed from generation one to three, uh, which is quite noticeable. Uh, here is the maintaining of the same planar structure uh, for three generations um, while um, offering a very competitive unresistant values compared to the actual devices with comparable um, electrical ratings. Uh, as well, um, a remarkable point is the uh, use of wafer thinning for the latest generations of the devices. Another example is uh, from Infineon, uh, where we analyze the CoolSeq uh, trench gate technology. Uh, as you may see on the bottom right, uh, scanning electron microscope. Uh, image uh, with a very specific doping profile from Infineon in correspondence to the theoretical sketch just above. Uh, again here uh, we notice that Infineon uses a significant wafer thinning uh, compared to the analyzed devices for the same voltage class, uh, that means here for 1.7 kV. Uh, what about performances now? In this chart, we compared um, performance of selected 1.2 kV silicon carbide MOSFETs in terms of a figure of merit, which is the gate charge times the unresistance. And what we can see in this uh, chart is that um, silicon carbide uh, designs have gradually been improved by the different manufacturers uh, all over the recent years. Uh, here we are highlighting uh, in red stars the trench gate structures that appear to have very interesting uh, electrical performance uh, concerning this figure of merit. Uh, you need to know that for this figure of merit, the uh, lower it is, the better is the performance. Uh, but which is also noticeable is some planar designs are really competing uh, trench uh, gate performance, uh, such as wall speed or on semiconductor uh, technology. Always in uh, electrical performance, uh, now we are uh, comparing current density of, of 1.2 kV silicon IGBTs uh, versus silicon carbide uh, MOSFETs. So in triangles here we represent silicon carbide MOSFETs and we circle silicon IGBTs. So um, dif different colors for different manufacturers, which is uh, here quite noticeable, in fact, um, is the clear difference in current density performances uh, between both uh, device uh, categories um, where we see silicon carbide MOSFETs have uh, better current density than uh, the, their silicon counterparts. So let's now uh, have a look to the cost. Uh, on the left graph, we uh, show an example of breakdown of a silicon carbide MOSFET wafer front end cost. Uh, where we can see that silicon carbide row wafer is a major cost driver uh, within silicon carbide front-end manufacturing. Uh, on the right, another example of uh, breakdown uh, concerning the front-end process steps. Uh, and here we clearly see that epitaxy has the biggest cost impact among uh, the other front-end step categories. In this final uh, comparative uh, graph, we are plotting um, a wafer cost uh, breakdown on the left axis and on the right, uh, the die uh, cost per current, or what you call the ampere cost, which is die cost divided by the current. Um, here, uh, first you mark is that the uh, row wafer cost 
is varying from uh, one manufacturer to another. And this is mainly due to the supply chain, which itself varies from one manufacturer to another. Um, and globally, what we can say here is that um, there is a competition in cost, indeed, between uh, different manufacturers. Uh, and uh, we uh, believe, according to our understanding, that this competition in cost uh, will push uh, the silicon carbide devices cost to be more and more acceptable uh, to the end users in the diff different uh, field of applications of silicon carbide in the near future. And finally, here we have a list of the reverse costing reports related to this subject from System Plus Consulting. And uh, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amin. So to finish this webcast, we will now listen to Dieter from WorldSpeed. So Dieter, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Kazi. And also to Eski and Amin, which did a perfect job in order to show the market trends and also the insights about the landscape of silicon colored products. Uh, my name is Dieter Elisabeth. I am Director of Automotive Business Development. I'm with Cree since eight years, and I just want to guide you a little bit around the view of Speed, how we are going to enable the battery electric driven market. Just from the starting point, um, maybe just some recent changes of the company Cree Speed. Basically, when Greg Lobe was coming on board three and a half years ago, uh, we started the transition from a uh, lighting LED focused company over to a powerhouse in power electronics around silicon carbide and gallium nitride chloride. Um, just by 1st of March, just a few days ago, we were selling our last final bit of LEDs uh, to Smart Global, and we are going to rename the company now to Wolfspeed. Uh, this is a major step forward, so to put the path with LED backwards and then looking forward on silicon carbide and gallium nitride products. Um, one of the biggest announcements which we did three years ago already is that we are implementing a big facility or the world's biggest facility for silicon carbide. And we announced also two or three weeks ago uh, that we are starting there uh, by beginning of 22 with 200 millimeter wafers. I come to this point later. And that we are also accelerating our capital investment and that we are uh, a little bit ahead of our, let's say, implementation so that we can serve the shortening in the market of material maybe even uh, further in this year already. So what is Wolfspeed doing? Um, so basically we are growing or, let's say, transforming powder into boots and to be honest, this is like forming uh, diamonds. Um, therefore, this base material, like Amin also pointed out, is quite expensive, um, as we are doing this under very high pressure and 2,400 degrees, so it's a very precise um, process which you have to control. But then you're also slicing, basically, diamonds, and this is also a very time-consuming and intensive market. And then you still have to polish the wafers. So you have seen that there's different thickness of wafers, and as, as thinner the wafers are, the better you have the um, losses under control out of the power mustard or silicon carbon tiles. Um, what we also provide is epitaxy, which we're doing in-house, and then of course we make our own mustard and tiles and package them in the different housing. Um, to enable the industry, we were also, let's say, serving um, all of our competitors because we want to build up an ecosystem for the industry around silicon carbide. And it is very clear and it was very clear in the past that we are not able to establish this kind of ecosystem if we are not serving also the big players in the industry. And you name them, we are a public contract with ST Microelectronics, Infineon and others. And um, for this, we really want to enable the complete ecosystem in this market. So coming about this investment, which we have announced in 2019, so if you look at the graph, uh, this total industry is really 
um, accelerating with a very, very high demand from the industry. And as Eski also mentioned, uh, the automotive market is one of the major driving force with this high power demand from 100 to 300 kilowatt inverters. And this is really driving the silicon carbide area which is needed in order to support the industry. Um, we have started with our RTP fab a um, long time ago, and then we converted basically in 2019 our LED fab uh, also to silicon carbide. So we are basically moving out all our silicon carbide LEDs and converting the second fab completely over to silicon carbide. But even with doing this and converting from four to six inch over the last three years, um, the capacity is really growing up rapidly, but the demand is uh, further and faster catching up than the supply can support. So the investment which we did back in 2019 um, to really ramp up the big capacity by 22 um, was a decision to uh, invest $1 billion in order to serve the entire market. And this is also something which we are driving still forward, that we are going in, uh, in partnership with our customers, with the tier ones, with the module makers, with the OEMs, in order to build the future around silicon carbide. What we envision is due to the, um, I would say, quarterly pull-in of the numbers for 25 and 2030 of electric vehicle, I would uh, envision that even this quantity which we put in place is maybe not enough and we have to consider to build a second mega fab um, by 24, 25 timeframe because the demand from the market and the pull is really moving forward. So what happened in the industry? There was already some of the slides shown by SD, but I just want to give you uh, also the view from our side and also the experience which uh, I made over the last eight years. So when I walked in eight years ago uh, to the first automotive customer, basically everybody was laughing that electric cars never will come, uh, silicon carbide will be always too expensive. Um, but we have seen what COVID can change to the industry and also what diesel gate can change to the industry. So the global warming is not a, um, um, it's not a thing which is um, uh, not realistic, but it's something real. And uh, the damage is uh, just in last year by global warming is $210 billion. So just paying a little bit for silicon carbide and save some of the energy uh, waste which we are doing every day, I think this is a good balance. And um, then basically nobody should even argue about a little bit higher cost of silicon carbide. And the green awareness due to COVID, where everything shut down, there were even people in Delhi or Beijing which saw first time in their life um, a blue sky. So the experience of the people are changing and the awareness gets better. And the societies are pushing forward and pulling forward a ban of combustion engines. So we are having now several countries which are banning by 25 already combustion engines, others by 2030. And this pull forward from all these governments is also driving then the car OEMs to pull forward to full electrical vehicles. And we have uh, prominent examples already, which is even announcing a 100% conversion to full electrical. So Volvo did this already, Nissan is announcing this, and I think um, the others will have to follow. And this means there will be even more demand for silicon carbide in the future. Also, as um, new vehicles uh, or battery electric vehicles are more easy to manufacture, there, will, there are more than 750 startups which are looking into this market and trying to catch the market uh, space. And there's more than $17 billion investment into these newcomers just in order to, to bring up a new uh, platforms for the industry. So what we envision just over the last four quarters, five quarters, is this is a view of uh, what is the battery electric vehicle market share by 2030. So even the numbers of vehicles are more or less flat over the next um, uh, several years by 2030, maybe a little bit down. But in reality, the part of full electric vehicles is increasing in every area. It's increasing in Europe, it's increasing in the US, it's increasing in China as well. And the acceleration is um, quite surprising to everybody because um, if you just compare a number of 25% 
then one year later, which is coming up to 50%, um, you have to consider to build factories in order to support this. And the same opposite is coming with the combustion engine. So it's really decelerating and going down further in demand. So what we are doing, um, I think it was shown already from um, SD as well, um, we are mainly concentrating on drivetrain inverter, auxiliary inverter, but there's also a great market for silicon covered in fuel cell DC DC converter, where you have a lot of uh, power savings using silicon covered onboard chargers, but even in solid state circuit breaker, which is also something when the currents are rising, the traditional um, circuit breakers um, are not reliable anymore. So therefore, a lot of people are even looking to utilize silicon carpet for solid state circuit breaker inside the car itself. And the main driving forces for everything here is high power efficiency, system cost reduction, and also range extension besides space and weight savings. So let's come to the more detailed point. Uh, what can silicon carbide really do um, for the industry, for the CO2 savings, for greener planet? And it's all about saving energy. And it may does not look very big if you say, oh, I'm coming from 94% efficiency to a 96 or 97, it's just 3% more. But this means you're cutting your losses by more than 70% which means also your heat dissipation is cut by 70%. So all of this kind of, let's say, very small changes here, which I would not even argue is small, it's even big changes, um, happen on the charger side with DC fast chargers. It happen on your onboard charger if you uh, slowly charge at home. And also the drive inverter, where you have the main uh, effect between 5 to 10%, depending on the drive cycle. So whenever you use silicon carbide in a inverter and you are using it in partial load condition, uh, you're always comparing a silicon uh, inverter, which has basically an IGBT curve and a, or diode curve, uh, compared to a resistor curve of a MOSFET. This means um, if you have the same rating of the peak power for IGBT and MOSFET with the same losses, then you have a huge advantage of silicon carbide in partial load because you are basically having half the losses in partial condition. And even if you have maybe a car with 100 or 150 kilowatt, you're using in your city cycles maybe 20 kilowatt only. So this is the thing where people really um, discover uh, partial load condition is uh, a great asset for silicon carbide, and this can then extend range, um, reduce CO2 emission, but even um, reduce cost for the owner of the car itself because you have to recharge less money and you're making less pollution to the air. Then there is a big, uh, I would say, um, battle about 400 versus 800 volt. Um, to be honest, um, I, I, I don't think whether this is good or bad for the one or the other side. There's advantages for 800 volt, there's advantages for 400 volt. At the end of the day, I, I would say the consumer will decide which kind of version he would like to have. Um, there's one major advantage for 800 volts, which is unbeatable, and I always say this, and this is user experience with fast charger. You can basically charge double, the, uh, double fast compared to a 400 volt system. And this makes the, the very big difference, despite other factors. So to put these things together, um, there is Battery savings, whether this is 3%, 6% for 800 volt systems against uh, 400 volt uh, IGBT systems due to this partial load condition. This is user experience, um, which I said is unbeatable or priceless, as some companies say. Um, this is 50% faster, and I don't want to see, or let's say, I, I, I see people maybe staying at a charging station and uh, need double the time than the other persons. I think next time they're buying an 800 volts version of a car. 
And the CO2 savings and the operational savings, they're not small. Um, CO2 emissions are going to get a penalty very soon over uh, every state. And this could be $60 per ton, this could be going up to $100 per ton or even higher. And then the CO2 balance of a car using a not so efficient system could be very bad compared to a car which is having uh, a better efficiency at the end of the day. And wasting energy is the worst uh, you can really do. You should basically have a 100% conversion. And unfortunately, this is not uh, real life as of today. So the longer range is um, basically a trade-off to battery savings. So you either have longer range or you have battery savings. So you cannot have both. And um, this is something the manufacturer has basically decided what to do. So they can keep the same battery and drive longer with the same um, inverter. So how are we approaching and tackling this kind um, of market change? Um, we have discovered over the course of the last five years that uh, silicon carbide uh, MOSFET itself is nothing without the surrounding system around. So it's, it's a bad eye, of course it's a base material as well, but then you have to create also modules, packages, then you have to create a control logic with inverters, and you have to get um, specialized um, driver uh, schemes, like um, having intelligence drivers in order to reduce the amount of um, chips inside the um, inverter. And then we are basically talking with all um, manufacturers from a module tier one and OEM level in order to make a best system integration and the best uh, system cost. Because just pushing the price on a bare die down is maybe one solution, but at the end of the day, you may waste a lot of energy and time in the wrong power module, in the wrong control logic which you're doing, or even, let's say, the battery management um, and the charger itself. So therefore, we are basically shown, looking into all these kind of sectors. Um, it was already talked about a partnership, and this is something which we have widened over the last years. Not only that we are supporting all our competitors with um, crystals and um, crystal wafers and epitaxy, but we are also partnering up with um, all module suppliers uh, because we ourselves cannot serve the entire market. And um, therefore we are going in partnership with module suppliers. But we're doing the same with uh, tier one suppliers in order to, to win together uh, in this system uh, the awards from the OEM. And even further, we are having deep dive discussion and even got awarded from Volkswagen for silicon carbide. And to have this collaboration on all levels is guaranteeing on the first side a secure supply chain at the end of the day, but also to having an optimized system for the people who have to build um, a car. So there was already a lot of talk about wafer capacity, so we are building, besides the uh, big announcement about our wafer front-end manufacturer, we are also uh, investing heavily in our crystal growth in order to support the entire ecosystem, uh, because we cannot serve the entire industry from our own fabs, so we need also our competitors and friends and partners on semi ST. Um, some other which didn't want to be named, Infineon, uh, to grow the industry together with us. And therefore, we are pushing the factories um, up. And the factory in um, Mark Valley will start um, beginning of 22 with 200 millimeter. This is a big change uh, compared to the initial view, which we had 2019, because in 2019, we thought we would still be on six inch. But the quality, purity, and the base material is so good on eight inch that we decided that we will bring in all the manufacturing tools, which is starting by August this year, and we are deploying the eight inch wafer from the beginning in Mark Valley. And we are already running in Sunny Pony, which is also our own dedicated line, um, already today eight inch wafer in order to make a copy paste of the process and then put the tools and the manufacturing uh, receipt into the factory. Partnering is not just a buzzword, but it's also you have to live it and have to have it into day-to-day -day life. 
And there will be those in partnering, some of them which are public, like Volkswagen, ZF, Delphi, which is now Bob Warner, ABB, Uton. But there's many, many others in the background where we are also partnering, but they don't have a public announcement made yet. And we are basically working together with everybody who wants also to work with us, because the supply constraint over the next years will be immense for this kind of industry. And we see this already today in other areas. We see microcontroller shortages and um, yeah, with TSMC and UMC, uh, which is really causing a big issue for the automotive industry. So to put it in a nutshell, uh, why silicon carbide? Um, I think it's very clear for everybody who is on the call today. It's higher efficiency, faster switching, improved thermal, higher power density. And wool speed or Cree was formed more than 30 years ago around silicon carbide and gallium nitride. And we are pushing capacity up to serve the entire market, not for our own capacity itself, but also to deliver wafers to the entire industry. And we are having more than eight years experience now with the MOSFET with more than six trillion field hours. So, the summary of this call is um, 30 years experience, worldwide leader in material itself, and we are really trying to enable the ecosystem route at the electrical vehicles by partnering with everybody. And in order to support the supply chain uh, demand for the future, we are ramping with 200 millimeter wafers already beginning of 22 in our more quality factory. And as a result, we try to reduce the CO2 footprint over the world and save energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jitter, for this very nice presentation. So it's time we are now going to wrap up with the Q&A session. We will answer as many questions today as we can and we will follow up via email for the remaining ones. So we have a really lot of questions. So let's start with you, Esgi. One question for you. What about the competition with GAN? Uh, can GAN be a treat to uh, SIC adoption in electric vehicles? Thank you for the question, Faisal. Yeah. So yeah, it's a good one. So actually, in our activity, we do also cover the, the power GAN, and today we are also seeing some kind of acceleration in, in GAN domain for the GAN development for the EV applications. It can be onboard chargers or the DC-DC, also the main inverter applications. But I think it's um, here yeah, it's important to note that intrinsically, SIC and GAN are really not the same. So the thermal conductivity and current density of uh, silicon carbide um, are much higher than uh, those of GAN. So that's why actually silicon carbide is more attractive solution for the main inverters, as um, Peter also said in his presentation. Uh, so GAN is uh, more of interest for the lower power systems for the OBC or, or 48 to 12 volt DC-DC converters. So I would say instead of a treat uh, threat, we can see, I think, more GAN and SIC as complementary solutions for the automotive industry in the next um, decade. Yeah. Thank you, Esgi. Uh, next question for you, Amin. Uh, actually, what would be the cost difference between SIC and silicon? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so let's say in average, uh, we estimate that uh, silicon carbide MOSFET uh, has a dye uh, ampere cost at least uh, three times higher than, than their silicon uh, counterparts. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dieter, uh, let's go a question for you. Which will be the winning battery voltage in the future uh, for battery electric vehicles? Um, 400 volts or 800 volts? Yeah, thank you for the question. I think this is a kind of um, very interesting discussion which we have basically with everybody um, in the industry. I personally would prefer that everything is moving to 800 volts because the benefits are more there. But there's, um, I would say, a transition coming over the next couple of years. Maybe by 25, uh, we will have um, a 10 to 20 percent adaptation of 800 volt system, and by 2030, maybe we are already at 50 percent of the systems. So I would say the transition is 
has been started with the high power cars with big batteries because they really need fast charging capabilities. But uh, the user experience will drive more and more in this direction. Even the cost maybe on a 400 volt system might be a little bit smaller. I think the advantages for the user is higher at the 800 volt system. Okay, very clear. Thank you. Uh, Esgi, uh, we have a question for you. Can you tell us the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the poorer sick market? Yeah, good question. Thanks for that one. Indeed, yeah, last year it was a tough one, and I think we are still stri struggling with the pandemic now. Uh, but what I can say that in our activity, we have really seen that power sick actually was uh, stronger than us, so the growth of the market continued in a way. So, okay, we have seen some uh, lockdowns of the, the OEMs, but also uh, yeah, some um, companies, foundries. And in general, there was less production in the first uh, half of the year. Some disruptions also happened in the supply chain. Uh, but the second half was uh, stronger, as we analyzed in our quarterly updated uh, monitor service. So, um, as Dieter also said, yeah, the design wins continue for silicon carbide. Uh, so, same goes also for the investments. So, I think we can really say everything is back on track now. So. Good. That's a good news. Thank you, Elgi. Uh, Amin, uh, uh, one for you. You have mentioned challenges facing uh, SIG packaging. Can we use this for SIG as for uh, silicon? Yes, yeah, thank you for the question, Faisal. Um, indeed, I just gave a glimpse about uh, packaging in the first slide of my presentation, since it was not the focus. Uh, but to answer to, to your question, um, we really need to fully benefit of silicon carbide technology uh, when talking about packaging. So uh, new packaging solutions must be developed uh, since silicon carbide devices can work at higher junction temperatures, uh, higher switching frequencies with, and with uh, smaller die sizes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Amin. Um, one question for Dieter. Uh, what are the biggest challenges in the uh, SIC market to overcome to get into the uh, mainstream market? I would say at the moment it's uh, supply capacity because, um, as I mentioned, uh, we are ramping up heavily the capacity for the industry, which is then also driving the cost down. So, so the more capacity you bring online, which is on the crystal growth side, on the epitaxy, but also then on the front end manufacturer, this will drive cost down. And then by driving cost down by this very huge demand from the automotive industry, it will also enable a lot of other markets which were in the past not using silicon carbide. So I'm just thinking about motor drive, which were very reluctant to utilize silicon carbide. But um, the benefits are already here today, and I think at a certain point in time, we will also switch over to silicon carbide, even in this kind of very conventional market. So the market will change, and um, it's just a matter of, let's say, price coming down, driven by huge demand from the automotive industry. Thank you, Dieter. Thank you. Uh, the webcast is uh, now over. We receive a lot of questions. We can see uh, how interesting is uh, this uh, topic. Uh, so we will answer uh, to the remaining question uh, directly by email. Uh, you will soon receive email with the link to the recorded session. Also, please uh, feel free to share the presentation with your colleagues. And please let me remind you that you can find all her reports on her webcast, www.hi-micronews.com. Do not hesitate to contact us if you have additional questions. You can find her contact details on the last slide of the presentation. Thank you all for joining us today. Have a good day and take care. Bye-bye.